Welcome to our review on infectious diseases and antibiotics. First thing we've got here then are two of the key terms we need to understand. So whenever we talk about a pathogen, what we're referring to is a microorganism that's going to cause diseases. And what we find is that some of these pathogens actually release a chemical called a toxin and that can actually cause damage to our cells and therefore make us ill. We need to remember not only the type of pathogens we've got, but also an example of each one for your exam. So they do like to ask you this question about name an example of a disease caused by one of these pathogens. Okay, so do make sure that you learn these examples of the pathogens and also the diseases caused by them. So what we look at first of all is the fungi, which will lead to athlete's foot. Bacteria can cause cholera. A virus, an example would be flu. And the protozoa, an example there would be malaria. So if they're asking about the types of pathogen, you're looking at the fungi, bacteria, virus and protozoa. And then obviously they've got the associated example of the disease caused. So athlete's foot by a fungus, cholera by a bacterium, flu by a virus and malaria by a protozoan. What we find with some infectious diseases is that they don't spread directly from one person to another, but they're going to use something called a vector to spread from person to person. Now, what we refer to as a vector is something like a mosquito. So it will land on one person, bite them, suck some blood and pick up a potential pathogen at that point. And then as they fly onto someone else and bite them, they then spread that pathogen to that new person. So malaria is an example of a disease that's caused by a protozoa and it's spread by these vectors of the female mosquitoes. So what we actually find is that when we're thinking about the malaria parasite, both humans and mosquitoes are hosts for it, but the mosquito is also the vector. So it's going to carry that protist from one person to another. If we stay thinking about malaria for a moment, because we know it's spread by the female mosquito, then we can actually take some steps to control malaria by controlling that vector. So some things that we can do to avoid spreading malaria just by avoiding the mosquito, we could sleep under a mosquito net and use insect repellents to obviously avoid them being able to bite us. You can drain any areas of stagnant water because the mosquito breeds in any of these areas of water, so we remove their breeding grounds. And we can use insecticides which will kill the mosquitoes. Another term we need to understand is the incidence. When we're referring to the incidence of a disease, we're talking about the rate at which new cases occur in a population each year. So normally we talk about this as cases per 10,000 or cases per 100,000 people. Now, what we'll find is that the incidence of a disease can depend on a couple of factors. Some diseases incidence will be affected by the climate and other diseases will be actually affected by the socio-economic factors. If we consider the climate first of all, if we've got these warm or hot places in the world, then what we tend to find is that some of these vectors are going to be able to multiply quite rapidly. If the vectors multiply rapidly, that means that we've got more of them available to spread the disease from person to person, so we tend to see an increase in the incidence. So an example there would be a malaria mosquito, and they need the water to breed, as we previously mentioned. So what we actually find there is that when we get a period of increased rainfall, then the incidence of malaria will increase following that, because the mosquitoes have then got that air of standing water, which allows them to breed, and therefore there are more mosquitoes to spread malaria to more people. When we're considering the socio-economic factors then, these will be different diseases that are affected here. So infectious diseases like cholera are a prime example of ones that are affected by socio-economic factors. Now cholera tends to be spread when there's contamination of drinking water by sewage. So what we tend to find is we'll get a much higher incidence of cholera in those countries where they don't have a clean drinking water supply and they don't have proper sewage treatment works. So these tend to be the poorer countries of the world because they haven't got the money to invest in developing the sewage treatment programs and they don't have the money to invest in clean drinking water supplies. 
Therefore, there is a much greater risk of sewage contaminating the water they are drinking, and so cholera is going to spread much more readily. Now, we do have treatments that we can use to deal with some of these pathogens that can infect us. And the first of those treatments, the one you're probably quite familiar with from your everyday life, are the antibiotics. Now, this is something that's been around for a good 70 years now. And the reason that we've got them is because they're produced by some bacteria and some fungi. So they actually make these antibiotics themselves as a way of preventing other bacteria and fungi from encroaching on the areas that they live. And what it actually does is it kills bacteria and fungi. So what they actually do in order to kill the bacteria and fungi is that they stop growth and they prevent certain metabolic reactions from occurring. And if those metabolic reactions can't take place, then it's going to lead to the death of that particular organism. One thing to make sure we do understand though is antibiotics do not kill viruses. So we cannot use antibiotics to treat a virus. And the reason behind that is that the virus doesn't actually grow and it doesn't have any metabolic reactions that can be prevented. So by taking an antibiotic, it's an absolute waste of time with a virus, which is why when you've got the flu and things like this, the doctor's never going to prescribe you an antibiotic because it won't do anything. Even though these antibiotics are amazing drugs, we do have to be careful in how we use them. So doctors should only be prescribing them to people when they're needed, and patients that are prescribed a course of antibiotics should make sure that they take all of them. Even after they start to feel better, you should take every single tablet the doctor has prescribed you. If we don't follow those two basic rules, then what we'll see is we're going to get more of these resistant strains developing. So we've got things like MRSA, which is a type of bacteria that's now resistant to a significant number of the antibiotics we have available. So that means that if you get that MRSA infection, a lot of the antibiotics we've got won't actually do anything. So we've got to make sure that we take the full course of antibiotics and that doctors only prescribe them when they're needed, Otherwise, we're going to see a greater increase in these resistant strains. Finally, we do have something we can do to deal with a viral infection. So we've got another group of drugs called antivirals. And the example I've given you there is Tamiflu. And those ones will deal with a viral infection in our body. And the way that they do that is by inhibiting the replication of the viruses inside the host. So if you get an infection with a virus, we do have antivirals available to us that we can take to then inhibit that viral replication.